Uh, good evening, Goldback families and guardians. It's an uh, absolute pleasure to have you join us for this evening town hall. Uh, I wanna just thank you for your feedback. Uh, several of you requested that we switch the time to the evening, and so we did. Uh, I'm joined today, this evening, by um, many of the executives, senior executives on our team, as well as department leaders. And several of them will be engaging with you this, after, uh, this evening regarding key updates, as well as answering critical questions that you submitted. And so I just wanna thank you for sharing those questions ahead of time. Uh, there are many questions and we're gonna to try to do our very best to get to as, most, to as many of them as we can uh, within the next hour. We're also gonna be working on an FAQ document. So the questions that we do answer, as well as the ones we don't get to this evening will be addressed in the FAQ document, which we're trying, uh, we're gonna work around the clock and try to get it out tomorrow evening. So please be on the lookout for that. I wanna encourage you to continue to uh, access the district webpage and very specifically access the operation reopen section as that's where you're gonna find all the key updates. Every time we get an update from the CDC, the Department of Health, as well as the New York State Department of Education, we include it on our, on our website so that way you have easy access to it. Uh, and again, what you're going to see this evening, what we're able to answer this evening, will all be included on the website. I'd like to spend just a little bit of time uh, addressing some requests that we recently have been receiving. We've been getting a number of uh, requests from parents wanting to homeschool their children. And while we understand parents absolutely have the right to homeschool, we just wanna make sure that parents aren't confusing homeschooling and remote instruction. And so in the event you put in a request to homeschool, but you really wanted remote learning, please let us know and we'll make the change. But let's, let's address uh, the differences between homeschooling and the district's uh, fully remote program. In a homeschool model, the parent or caregiver assumes full responsibility for addressing state standards and assessing their children in alignment to those standards. The parent or uh, guardian is responsible for the socialization of their children and again, overseeing the critical formative and summative and interim assessments associated with educating a child throughout the academic year. The parent is also responsible for securing the curriculum and obviously delivering the content of that curriculum. So here the emphasis is on the parent or guardian delivering an instruction, whereas the district's 100% remote plan the district assumes the responsibility. The district um, identifies the curriculum. Teachers deliver the content in that curriculum. And our teachers assess children, even though they're home remotely. Our teachers will be the ones testing, providing formative assessments, interim assessments, and summative assessments throughout the academic year. In this model, children um, have to take, take state exams, as well as any internal exams administered. All right, so just some quick uh, nuances between the different models. And again, if you put in a request for homeschool, we will honor that. But we just wanna make sure uh, you met a true homeschool model and not the district's remote. So if you intended to uh, fulfill the survey and identify that you wanted the remote model, but put homeschooling, we are going to open up the survey one more time to allow parents to make the adjustments one and or any other parents who maybe thought they wanted hybrid but now want remote. That deadline is gonna be Sunday, this upcoming Sunday, August 23rd, with the deadline being 1159. At that point, we are going to close out the survey. There is a lot of back-end planning that's required in order to have an in-person program as well as a remote program. And our, and our administrators, they are working very diligently to make the necessary adjustments. And it's not an easy one. So 
I understand there are a number of requests from families wanting to see schedules and wanting to know who their teacher is going to be, and, and that's valid. And normally, this is the time of year when that would happen. Unfortunately, because of the amount of requests that have come in, and at this point, we are over 4,400 students that have been opted out of the face-to-face -face program, this is requiring a lot of back-end planning. So I'm just going to ask that you give our administration uh, the flexibility and the space to work through these challenges. Uh, it's not something that's going to take a few days and or a few weeks. It's going to take a little bit of time to ensure there is a solid program that is both remote and in person. Uh, so I'm going to address some key questions that um, many parents have submitted, and then we're going to jump right into providing you some key updates. Uh, so we've gotten a number of questions regarding when the first day of school is. Uh, so as of the calendar today, the first day of school for students, and we did uh, share with the community that the entire month of September is going to be 100% remote. So the first day of remote instruction for students is September 2nd. However, we are bringing to the board this upcoming Tuesday a recommendation to change the calendar so that the first day of school for students is actually Tuesday, September 8th. So this is pending approval. Once the board approves, if they do, then we will communicate uh, to you that same night to let you know that the change was made. So just, uh, just be on the lookout for the robocall and the announcement on social media. We will let you know that night if the first day of school will change. We also have a number of questions regarding when will new families learn building assignments. So Dr. Roman, can you answer that question, please? Yes, good afternoon. In terms of pre-K and kindergarten, um, I spoke with the registration team today. And by September 1st, uh, they will be mailing um, home notices regarding school assignments. Um, and, and, and that's kind of where, where we're at. They're working very diligently to make sure that that happens um, as soon as possible. Okay, thank you, Dr. Roman. Again, more information will be forthcoming. So at this time, I'm gonna ask our assistant superintendents to provide an overview uh, to the family guidebook that we shared with you on July 31st that is currently on our website. And based on Today and tomorrow, we will be making revisions to the guidebook that will be released to you tomorrow evening. Uh, Mr. Baer and Ms. Moriarty, can you please share uh, critical updates as it relates to teaching and learning? Sure, thank you, Dr. Badia. So I'm gonna go first and then Andrea will follow. My name is Chris Baer, I'm the Assistant Superintendent and we have the obligation to, um, to present and then to have on the website a remote remote learning plan. As Dr. Bredia said, we have the guidebook for families that has much of the information needed, but uh, Governor Cuomo asked that we specifically have an additional addendum with regard to the remote learning component of our reopening plan. So as you go through it, we are um, highlighting certain aspects that are important to families, uh, beginning with the first page, and I'll let uh, Ms. Moriarty begin that conversation. Thank you, Mr. Bayer. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the first item in our remote learning plan that we're addressing is the Chromebooks. And I know there have been a lot of questions, especially around the primary students receiving uh, Chrome, Chromebooks who did not uh, receive them in the spring. So for our students pre-K through second grade, they will be receiving Chromebooks. Um, I believe there's a distribution this evening actually for second grade students. That's the exciting news. And all new entrants will, entrants will also receive a Chromebook. Um, we were fortunate enough to be able to um, submit and um, put our order in for Chromebooks in May uh, or earlier, even earlier. However, we've been notified by the company that there's a slight delay, as you can probably realize everyone around the world um, for business, for home and for schools is ordering devices. So we're hopeful that we will have the Chromebooks in district by mid-September and at that time immediately turn them around to our families and our students in pre-K through second grade. So very soon, all of our students pre-K through second grade will have a Chromebook device. That's one update to this remote learning plan. I think we can continue on. So thank you. And um, 
so as you can see from the blue in the in these uh, in this plan, a lot of what we've tried to provide in the plan was links to either the family guidebook or things within. So that way, if families are looking for specific information, they can hyperlink to it in another place. Um, that makes that way you have the information readily available. One of the key, um, just two key areas that we want to highlight is that during the remote component of the reopening plan in September. All learning will begin at 9 a.m. It is the expectation that families and students will log in at that point. That during the uh, fall of this reopening plan, the, the expectation is that teachers will have a synchronous lesson, which means a live lesson via Google Classroom, where they will be presenting a mini lesson to the students who have logged in. That initial login with the teacher is really meant for a check-in, see how kids are doing, uh, there might be some work around just, uh, you know, helping them out social emotionally and then there'll be a mini lesson. After that, they'll go into uh, various different, um, both synchronous and asynchronous learning opportunities um, throughout, throughout their schedule. At the secondary level, the expectation is that uh, students sign in for each period that they have, so beginning at nine o'clock. What is uh, an update in this particular page is the attendance that we're going to be taking. In the spring, we were not required to take daily attendance. The governor had waived that obligation, but in the reopening plan, we must have an attendance process where we take attendance daily. So in this plan, we have um, come up with two ways in which uh, children will be counted as attending school. The expectation, as I said, is that students sign in at nine o'clock and then for each subsequent lesson at the secondary level. And uh, if students sign in at nine, one of the things the teachers will do is take attendance. So certainly for the students that the majority of students, we expect them to be part of that in per, that uh, live synchronous lesson that occurs beginning at nine o'clock. We also know from the feedback we got from families that there are some families where logging in at that time might be difficult, um, either on a occasional basis or just because of the fact that parents work or they won't have the ability to really oversee their children's ability to get in at that time. So we wanna provide the flexibility that if for those families that can't log in and be part of the live lesson that they, the teachers will be providing a recorded video of that mini lesson that will be placed on the Google Classroom and that students can then go in, which we refer to as an asynchronous time or some other time of the day, watch the video and then complete the activity that's associated with that video. If they do that by 1159 of the day of that, of that scheduled day, or this, uh, that scheduled activity or, or class, they will be counted as well as being in, in attendance. So there are two ways. One is you participate live at the time at which the, the teacher is available in the Google Classroom, and second is to watch the video and do the activity somewhere else throughout the day. On this page, I think the takeaways are um, to highlight digital etiquette, which means that um, we're ensuring that all students um, are are practicing proper etiquette, are behaving properly, using social media, using the, the platforms and the software that are provided to them, to them for their learning. So um, we ask that all families review the technology acceptable use policy, as well as the student code of conduct. And as Mr. Bayer indicated, there are several links throughout this document where you can get, get more information and further clarification. So the links are there in Spanish and in English, but it's most important that students are not videoing the, meet, the Google Class Meets. They're not taking pictures of their peers and sending them out. They're not taking pictures of their teachers and sending them out, but they're, they have the expectation for learning just as if we were in the classroom. Um, you're there to learn and to behave appropriately. Uh, additionally, the, there are so many resources. Um, available to us. We're fortunate to have lots of software and platforms to be able to provide virtual learning to students, um, but it does become overwhelming. So there's a link of what the resources are that teachers might be using, what the purpose is, and uh, how to use them. There are some videos also instructional for so families will know how to use them and access them. In the event that you're still struggling, because it is a lot of information and can be difficult at times, there's a link to the ITF, the uh, Instructional Technology Support that each building has. Uh, and if you click on that link, their email address will come up and they'll respond to your question specifically about technology or the programs that we're using. 
Additionally, on this page, we highlight equity, which um, Newburgh School District and Large City School District is very committed to ensuring that all of our students have access to a rigorous and appropriate education. Um, so at the secondary level, that looks more like how do we ensure that all students that are interested in taking an AP class, an advanced placement, advanced placement class, have access to that, to the early college classes that we offer, to the P-TECH program and to the CTE classes. Um, how do we ensure that all families have hotspots and devices? Again, I'm seeing some of the questions um, asking about how, do, uh, how does a middle school student uh, receive a, a, a device? We will ensure um, at, the, at the sites that everybody who needs a device will receive one. Um, but sometimes, even when you have the hotspot or the Chromebook or the laptop, the devices don't work for whatever reason. Every situation may be a little bit different. In that event, um, it'll be our responsibility to provide learning packets to students. Um, so we just ask that in the event that your technology is not working or you're having trouble accessing uh, the learning virtually, that you contact your building administrator and we'll work out a plan to ensure that your child, the student, will receive a paper packet. Also, we use a lot of terms like asynchronous, synchronous, hybrid, virtual. Um, we use these, these terms, we just throw them around because we talk about it every day, but I know that not everybody understands or is, is using the same language. So we thought that it was um, important to ensure that there's a glossary at the end of this, that if you just click on it, we'll tell you um, a, a little bit more about what that means and how it applies to the learning. Continue throughout the document, as Mr. Bayer indicated previously, um, we want to make sure that you are able to communicate with your schools. So a list of the building administrators is provided with contact phone numbers, and we will be updating it with their email addresses as well. There's the ITFs. So if you have a question about uh, technology, that's who you should email according to your child's school. And then again, the glossary of commonly used terms. So that concludes our piece this evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Moriarty and Mr. Bear. I'm gonna start in, uh, asking some of the questions that came in before we move into testing, and I'll do this after each section. So there's questions here from parents and guardians regarding technology. Uh, do pre-K through one students receive a Chromebook? And so the answer to that is eventually yes. I want you to know based on our proactiveness, uh, way back in the spring, in May, we ordered several thousand Chromebooks that were supposed to be delivered early uh, August. Unfortunately, schools all around the world are ordering laptops. And so the uh, delivery did get pushed back to uh, September. Uh, so we're hoping that it's early September and not late September, but nevertheless, those districts that were not proactive will be receiving Chromebooks and other laptops much later in the fall and winter, like November and December. So um, there are questions in here about packets. Uh, in the interim, we will be working with our teachers and administrators to uh, make sure that our primary students have access to packets. Uh, there's a question here about uh, how will assignments be posted? So Ms. Moriarty. Sure. Um, assignments will be posted uh, in the Google Classroom. There will be synchronous learning, which is live learning, and asynchronous, which will be assignments that are posted in the Google Classroom that students will do independently on their own. Additionally, the teachers will provide information about how they expect students to, uh, to submit their work to the teachers. There'll be a, ver a variety of different platforms and they'll give direction on that. But the Google Classroom or Seesaw at the primary level, and we'll be providing more information about that, will be where you go to access what are the assignments. Okay, thank you. Uh, there was questions around, there were some questions around how attendance works and uh, both you and Mr. Bear uh, address those. There's a question here around when will we receive the schedule for hybrid learning? And so as I indicated earlier, uh, our administrators are working and have been working all summer on uh, 
master programming. Uh, but when we closed out the survey on August 10th, they now had to account for all the students who opted to go remotely. Uh, so now they're having to work through uh, those new requests. And so it is gonna take us a little bit of time. And again, I'm just asking that you give them, uh, give them your patience as they do work through uh, figuring out how to support students both remotely and in person. Uh, there's a question here around, when will we receive supply lists for this year? So can one of you answer that? Sure, thank you. Um, schools have started to post their supply lists on the website and I believe also send hard copies in the mail. Uh, we want to reassure families that the supply lists are suggested supplies. Um, it's not things that you have to have, but suggested. Additionally, this year we've um, added a, a virtual, um, so an at home supply list and an at school supply list. So that it, in the event, just like we are in September, that your student, is, your child is learning from home, what are some things that will help them be able to complete those assignments? And if you have any um, problems finding some of those items or you have questions about them, please feel free to um, contact your school directly because we are, they are ready to offer support with that. Okay, thank you. There's a question here around standard school-wide events. How will they be conducted? Uh, and they're speaking to orientation, back to school nights, parent-teacher conferences. At this time, the district has decided that all of those events will be done virtually. So, uh, Back to school night that we uh, traditionally have had in October will now be done virtually, as well as parent teacher conferences. Uh, there's a question here regarding, will NFA West have internships this year? And that's not a question we can answer at this time. I know our administrator that's at West is working really hard to ensure that the integrity of the NFA, uh, pro NFA West program stays intact. Uh, but there are some things she's just really up against that is out of her control. And we're gonna figure out how to support our, our campus at West. Uh, so that is to be determined at this point. There's a question here regarding, will students be allowed to play sports? Uh, and what we know at this point is that the season for the fall has been pushed back to the end of September, that regional and state championships have been canceled. The fall season as of today has not been canceled just yet. Uh, and we're hoping that it's not, but in the event that it is, we certainly will communicate that to you. Uh, whenever the state releases information around what will be allowed for fall sports, we will also make that available to you as well. We have a question regarding, will all AP courses be available? And as of today, yes, that, that is our intent is to offer uh, a bevy of AP courses that we know our students look forward to. Uh, and as it was discussed earlier regarding equity, now more than ever, and we are, we are a community and district committed to ensuring equity and access. And so any child who wishes to access an AP course will be allowed. So I'm, I'm trying to be very, very clear about that. Uh, there's no criteria. If a child wishes to be challenged academically, uh, please reach out to the school counselor and the school administration and work with them uh, to get your child enrolled. Uh, so I answered the workbook already. All right, can we move to testing at this point? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Padilla. This is Ed Forget, Deputy Superintendent. So with regards to testing, um, the district uh, will not be requiring uh, faculty, staff, students to uh, be tested for COVID-19. Um, it is not something that we as a school district are, are going to adopt at this point. Um, as we think about testing, it, the way we will guide testing is as students enter the building, uh, they will periodically answer a series of questions with regards to their health. The results of those questions will then be used by the nurses to determine the next steps. We're hoping that there are no issues with the responses to the questions and that they also pass a check of their temperature. And at that point, they will be gain access into the schools. In the event a student has a temperature at the point of entry into the school, 
uh, the nurse will then counsel and work with that particular student and contact the families to talk about the situation and to uh, provide the advice to take the student to their healthcare provider and allow the healthcare provider to work with the family to make the decision as to what the next steps would be. Uh, so um, in the event a student becomes ill throughout the day and they do elevate a, to a temperature and they have a few other symptoms, the student will be brought to the health office and will be isolated from all the other students. And the nurse would then again contact the family or the guardian and have a conversation with them with regards to next steps. Uh, but as far as testing, we will follow the protocols of the Orange County Department of Health and the New York State Department of Health. And that will be a decision between the healthcare provider and the parent and guardian. In the event you, as a parent or guardian, you would like assistance and guidance, we would be happy to help you with securing a testing site or engaging in a conversation with your healthcare provider. Uh, just reach out to us and we're here for you. But as far as all the, the news that you hear going on with regards to testing for COVID-19, the district will not be requiring testing at this point. Thank you, Mr. Forge. There are a number of questions related to this section. So uh, please answer, will children have to wear a mask in their classroom, even if their desks are six feet apart? Yes, they will, Dr. Padilla. Um, all students, all faculty, and all staff will wear masks all day. The only time the masks will come off is if uh, during uh, food service, when they're having their breakfast or their lunch, or if at some point during the day they are becoming irritated and they, it just is starting to bother them, they can speak to the teacher and request to have a break. Uh, that will be coordinated by the teacher or the principal. Those are the only times the mask can come off. And it's and, it is social distancing and mask. Thank you. Uh, there's a question here around, will mask be provided if needed? So uh, in the event a student arrives and they don't have a mask, uh, we will definitely provide for them at that point or at any point throughout the day that the student needs another one. All right, you answered this question, will students be required to have a COVID test prior to a school starting? The answer to that is no. Uh, will students share materials in general or do they have to bring their own things? So I'll defer to Mrs. Moriarty for that, but I believe there are uh, protocols in place to provide students with individual uh, materials and resources to the greatest extent possible. And then when that's not possible, there will be cleaning done on a routine basis to sanitize those individual materials. Is that correct, Mrs. Moriarty? Yes, Mr. Forget, thank you. That's correct. Um, Mr. Forget, if a, if a scholar tests positive, and I will add if a scholar or an adult tests positive, what will be the protocol? The protocol will be uh, depending upon how we are notified. Uh, if we're notified by the parent, we will know who the individual is. So we will know how to do uh, contact tracing and Dr. Roman's gonna share with us contact tracing. So in the event a parent or a guardian calls and gives us that information and it's verified, uh, we are then able to uh, do a trace and find out who the other students were and to work with the Department of Health to then uh, contact the, those individuals. It's a, it's a relationship between the Department of Health and the district when it comes to positive cases, and even when we're trying to determine cases. It, it's, it's that type of relationship. Okay, thank you. We're gonna move on to contact tracing. Uh, but I also wanna ask, there's a question from a parent uh, wanting to know if they know of someone not following the guidance and not staying in compliance, who could they call? And so, I really appreciate the question. Go ahead, Mr. Forge. Yeah, I appreciate the question uh, because this is about safety for everyone. Um, and so can you please share what the protocol is? Sure, so uh, it, this is a district decision. This was Dr. Badia and myself deciding that this was really important because some people may not feel comfortable sharing this information with anyone. Uh, we have an email uh, address, it's in the guidebook, it's on our website, and we have a phone number if you want to remain anonymous where you can call and leave a message. In the event you see something that's concerning or you're just needing additional guidance and don't feel comfortable, you may email the, 
the specific COVID-19 email or you may call the COVID-19 hotline. Uh, those calls go right into our office. They will be reviewed by the support staff in our office uh, three times a day and we will respond uh, as quick as we possibly can in the event someone wants a response. In the event someone doesn't want a response, we'll react to whatever the issue was. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go ahead and put up contact tracing. Thank you, Dr. Padilla. Um, so regarding contact tracing, um, you heard a little bit about um, it with the testing uh, procedures. Uh, the process is basically how, how do we identify all individuals um, who may have been in contact with someone who tested positive. And so our responsibility as a district is to work collaboratively with the state and local health departments um, regarding uh, this process. And so we need to ensure that we're keeping accurate attendance records, um, that we are ensuring all schedules, student schedules are up to date. Um, we're also making sure that any visitors that enter the building, we are recording date, time, um, and any locations in which they travel within the school building. Uh, we will, of course, notify um, if we are aware of any individuals that do test positive, our responsibility is to make sure that we notify uh, the Department of Health. And, um, and so, um, fortunately, we have this, this system. Um, it's a platform that during the last Board of Education meeting, uh, the board had approved the purchase of a system that will allow us to automate and streamline the contact tra uh, tracing process. And what, what it will do is to uh, really um, generate um, heat maps, which identify if a student in a particular area uh, was tested positive, it will be able to track who in that area was came in contact with the individual. Uh, the system will also keep track of the questions, the four questions that have to be responded to on a daily basis by our, our staff or visitors and periodically for for our students. Uh, and of course, we're going to be adhering to all confidential uh, information as required by federal and state laws um, whenever disclosing any information regarding COVID-19 um, status. Uh, so in a nutshell, that that is the process for, for contact tracing. Okay, thank you, Dr. Roman. Uh, I'm going to continue to ask questions that uh, parents and guardians submitted. Uh, so this is under facilities. Uh, and so I'm going to ask Dr. Spindler to please answer these questions. What is the plan with Wednesday? Will it be a deep cleaning day? Okay, so um, on Wednesdays and um, either Fridays or Saturdays, we, in, we have secured eco sprayers and Clorox machines and disinfectants that will allow us to fog um, individual classrooms, office areas, and the entire school building. And we intend to do it on that um, Wednesday. And then one time between Friday and Sunday. So the fogger machine has the ability to, um, it releases the spray that adheres to surfaces for anywhere from 24 to 48 hours to protect that surface um, from the COVID virus. Okay, thank you. I'm going to combine these two questions because we've been getting uh, requests regarding filters and HVAC systems. So can you just speak to where what the district has done around uh, filters and HVAC? Absolutely. So um, in regards to ventilation, obviously our, con our custodians are going to continue to comply with instructions on building ventilation and opening of windows when it's safe and appropriate. And as part of our energy performance contract, we had the ability to um, conduct and survey and service and refurbish our univents throughout the district um, and replace motors and check um, how they were working. And if they were in need of repair, they have been repaired. We will be utilizing the MERV 13 filter, filter, which is above the recommended MERV 11 filter. They will be inspected every 30 days and changed every 60 days, superseding the 90 day recommendation. And um, I think that's about it on those. Yep, thank you very much. I'm gonna move on to safety and security. There's a question here regarding with social distancing guidelines, how will emergency drills be handled? And I'll have our director of 
safety and security, Mr. Tindall, answer that question. Thank you, Dr. Padilla. Um, so the state is still requiring us to run our 12 safety drills a year. Um, eight of those drills will have to be evacuation or more commonly known as fire drills. Four of those drills have to be lockdown drills. We get to alter um, based off the state's recommendations, these drills from how we did them in previous years. For um, the evacuation drills, we still have to leave the building. That's, that's non-negotiable. We have to do that. Everyone has to evacuate the building, but we're going to do that in a controlled manner, um, evacuating classrooms at a time or wings at a time, um, depending on the building itself and letting one uh, class clear a hallway before the next one evacuates. So it'll be in a very controlled manner. Um, lockdown drills, we're not actually gonna have the students hide in a corner um, the way we would do. It's gonna be a facilitated lockdown where the faculty or staff member in the room with the students is gonna facilitate a discussion with the students and go over our emergency procedures and how, when we would lock down, why we would lock down. And it, it, it's gonna be that facilitation. All the principals know that in case of a real emergency, um, they will follow our normal lockdown procedures. Um, and that's how it's gonna be done for this school year. Thank you very much. I'm gonna move on to food services. Uh, there are several questions here. The first one being, what is lunch going to look like in all of the school buildings? Good evening, everyone. Um, so the lunches will be served in the classroom uh, for all of our scholars pre-K to 12. In the uh, elementary schools, we, breakfast and lunch, I should say, will be served in the classroom. Um, we will have options for the students. It will be a hot lunch, a cold lunch, and a sandwich lunch available. We are uh, making sure that allergies are taken into consideration, so we will not be providing any foods that contain nuts, uh, peanuts, to the classrooms. So if you have a student with a severe allergy, that's one thing that you won't have to worry about coming from the cafeteria. Uh, and additionally, all of those meals will be still at, at no cost to all students in our district. Hey, thank you, Ms. Lazarski. We have several more. Uh, will food be distributed to children who opted to be online only until January? So yes, we will be providing meals, um, whether they have opted to be 100% virtual or they have opted or they have not phased into um, to their hybrid model. We will be providing those meals on Wednesdays. So in the spring, we heard that it was very difficult to leave the students while they were committed to their um, online classrooms. So we are doing this once a week, five days of breakfast and lunch will be provided at one time. We will be releasing the locations and the times for those. I can also tell you that we have added some evening pickups, so three to 5 p.m. Uh, so again, we have some other opportunities if families are working uh, for meals to be picked up. Meals will we can be picked up by the adults and students do not have to be there, but you will have to provide a um, ID number or the student name for who you're picking up for, which is different than the spring. Okay, thank you. Will all students get lunches at school or do they need to bring them from home? So we are still encouraging all of our families to participate in our meal programs, whether they are virtual or they are in school programs. Um, they are free to all students and, um, you know, we will, be, we will be there ready to serve them breakfast and lunch every day um, for all of our students. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on to transportation, and we have our Director of Transportation with us, Ms. Coyne. Ms. Coyne, how many scholars are allowed to be on the bus at once? Our plan at this point is to have 20 students on a big bus, one student per seat, uh, but we can, if needed, increase that capacity to up to 50 percent. Ms. Coyne, do students have to wear a mask on the bus? Absolutely. Just like they have to do in the classroom, the bus is an extension of the classroom. If a child doesn't have a mask, how will they get on the bus? All the bus drivers will be supplied with a number of masks for any student that doesn't have a mask at the, when they try to get onto the bus. Okay, thank you. Uh, where will students who are driven by parents be dropped off? 
each school will have a designated area for parent drop off and pick up. Okay, thank you. Will pre-K students ride the same buses as the rest of the elementary students? Uh, no, as in the past, the pre-K students ride a separate bus. They have a monitor on their buses to assist them. And uh, that is how it will continue this year. Okay, how often and quickly would the buses uh, be disinfected? The buses are going to be cleaned and or disinfected every day, twice a day. So after the morning uh, runs, they'll be cleaned or disinfected. And after the PM runs, cleaned or disinfected. Okay, and last transportation question. Uh, will students be transported to a school district outside of the district? And my guess is that may be for parents who send their children to uh, districts outside of Newburgh. Right. So any students that are attending schools outside of the district, nothing changes for them. We will follow their transportation schedule for their school as we have done in the past. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I have a social emotional learning question uh, that I'd like uh, Dr. Roman to answer. Will teachers or counselors be available if my child has emotional difficulty learning through a virtual setting? Uh, Dr. Roman or Ms. Peterson? So, uh, yes, yeah, so in, in, like in the past, uh, during the school closure, um, students, can, students or families can certainly access um, a one-to-one -one meeting with a school guidance counselor, uh, social worker. They will be available to support our, our students with regards to their social emotional uh, learning needs. I'm not sure if Ms. Uh, Peterson wants to add anything to that. It's also important to add that every school counselor, social worker, and psychologist does have a, will have a Google Classroom where there'll be activities for students that may be struggling, and they will also be available to connect families and students to community-based resources. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question listed under English language learners. So, Ms. Beato, what if, what if the child is having difficulty uh, with a particular subject and the parent is unable to help him or her due to the fact that they may not have the knowledge themselves. How can they get help? Thank you, Dr. Padilla. ENL students will have ENL standalone schedule in addition to their content areas and the co-integrated ELA ENL. ENL teachers are equipped to provide additional support with language and content instruction. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question here regarding, do I need to get a Chromebook if I already have one? Uh, and I know our Director of Instructional Technology is here, uh, but I'll quickly answer and say, if you already have a Chromebook, uh, no, you will not be getting another one, nor do you need to come and receive another one. Uh, again, it's our goal to have pre-K through 12 uh, receive a Chromebook. Uh, will scholars be required to bring in Chromebooks on hybrid days? And the answer to that is yes, they will. Uh, that is their key learning device, uh, especially during this time period. So whether they're at home or they're in person, their Chromebook should be with them at all times. Uh, I have some questions here regarding exceptional learners. Will kids receive their therapy, OTPT, play therapy, and speech? Mr. Bear? Thank you, Dr. Badia. So yes, um, they will. Um, as in the spring, um, we have the challenge of providing services um, remotely. So that may be in the form of having conversations with students and you um, as, as family members, emailing the direct service we're working on um, we have begun the training process for our related services personnel to, be, to provide what's called teletherapy, which is a way in which we can interact with students across um, a Chromebook. Um, and there's training that's required for that. So our staff will be doing that training very soon. The challenge has always been that a majority of the students have group services. So we are just for privacy issues, cannot bring a group of three into a speech therapy um, session even as remotely. So we'll be working on individual cases where we can maybe bring students in um, who do have individual services as well as uh, ways in which we can 
make sure the families are staying on top of the goals with our support. Thank you. Will students with an IEP be attending in class more days than general ed students? So as Dr. Padilla described, um, September is a remote month, so all students will be home. If and when we move to phase two, um, which hopefully that will be in October, the expectation is that stu uh, special ed students may come in for up to four days. The reason being that we're gonna be moving to a cohort model a core model requires us to split a class of, for example, 24 students into groups of 12 and have them attend either on a Monday, Tuesday, or a Thursday, Friday schedule. But our special class programs are already 12 or eight, so they are their own cohort. So if we do move in the direction of having students um, in person, at that point, we can likely bring our special class students in four days a week. Okay, thank you. Uh, what supports will be available for students with IEPs that are 100% virtual? Uh, the federal government and the state government has provided guidance on that, and uh, we have posted them as well. It, it, we continue to provide the Google Classrooms and provide whatever's in the IEP. Again, it's individualized. There are students who have teaching assistants and aides. It's the expectation of that support staff to be in the, in the Google Classrooms with the teacher. Again, the key difference is we will have synchronous learning um, this, this fall um, for all students. Some of the exceptional learners experienced that this summer where we did have synchronous learning and the feedback from families, it was very positive. I think it's important, and I didn't say that earlier, that our, our, all of our students have that opportunity to see the faces of their, their teachers, especially because they may be new for them, as well as all of their peers that may be new as well. So, if their individual concerns will be made, all our teachers and support staff will be available to address them for our exceptional learners. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bear. And lastly, uh, does choosing a virtual, does choosing virtual mean a scholar lost his or her spot in a particular program? If we're talking special education, absolutely not. That, that program will be there for that student whenever they decide to access it, either remotely or in person. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now moving back to teaching and learning, uh, I have a question regarding what type of training are teachers receiving to do live instruction? And before I ask Ms. Kronk to answer the question, I wanna, uh, I wanna highlight our teachers. Uh, from the moment that we were forced to close, our teachers stepped up. The Newburgh teachers were absolute trailblazers uh, during this entire time and continue to, to do so. Uh, they have engaged in over a thousand different training courses in order to equip themselves to be good at doing virtual instruction. Uh, and when you get a chance, you should commend, commend a teacher for the work that's been taking place during this time. Commend our administrators. They've been really uh, standing shoulder to shoulder, ensuring that we are learning we're taking risks, we're exploring, we're being innovative, and that's all because we're keeping students front and center. Ms. Cronk, can you answer some of the additional training that teachers have been engaged in? I'd be happy to, yes. So our teachers have been focusing specifically on virtual delivery models and hybrid delivery models. So we're not just studying how to deliver um, over a virtual format, but also how to counterbalance that uh, when we go to a hybrid methodology as well. Our teachers have really jumped into all effective practices and we've made a study on hybrid teaching. We have a number of resources available and Dr. Padilla, like you said, from the moment we closed, we have offered over a thousand sessions on virtual learning, well over. So I'm really proud of all the work that they've done. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, so I have some questions here regarding uh, what are the start and end times for virtual learning? So uh, students, all students will be required to start instruction every day at nine o'clock. So their, their school day will be from nine to 315. Teachers will start at eight o'clock and have from eight to nine to engage in a number of different uh, activities, whether that be planning, whether that be communicating with you or your child, whether that be engaging in additional training that Ms. Kronk just talked about, and or looking over the work that your children are completing. Uh, will online learning be done synchronously? And the answer to that is yes, that will be happening every single day. 
Uh, so that's a big you know, change from the spring. We are requiring that synchronous instruction uh, take place daily. Uh, and so you should uh, be on the lookout for that. The next question is, will the district require cameras to be on during remote lessons? And the answer to that is also yes. Uh, so the camera should be on at nine o'clock because teachers need to take attendance in elementary. And if your child is in middle school or high school, they should ensure that the camera is on at the start of every period uh, because the new teacher will have to also take attendance. Uh, but the teacher may require that the camera be on because he or she is delivering key instruction. Uh, there may be appropriate times when the camera can be off, such as when the child has to go to the bathroom or when the teacher says, okay, you have 15 minutes to uh, engage in this exercise, and in 15 minutes, cameras come back on, and we will uh, share out. I'm just giving you a few uh, ideas or examples. Uh, the camera could be on when the teacher is wrapping up the lesson and assessing mastery for the day. So yes, the camera should be on, especially at the start, uh, for attendance purposes and any other time the teacher requires it. Will children uh, be able to participate in gym and recess? Mr. Baer, Ms. Moriarty. So yes, students will be um, able to, um, even during remote times, um, have gym synchronously. Um, the gym teacher will provide uh, phys ed lessons uh, through the Google Classroom. Uh, recess teachers will be able to take students outside. I believe um, Dr. Spindler has indicated that there will be a cleaning uh, plan and a social distancing plan for using the playground equipment. But we will encourage teachers to take students outside um, to get a fresh air and to have time to play. And just one more thing in regard to gym, the, the, the guidance requires us to keep students 12 feet apart during the activities that were they uh, uh, more respiration. And we're working with the building administration uh, and the um, athletic department to develop those protocols of how we'll be able to deliver gym in the, in the event that we do become in person. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm trying to just see if I missed anything. Uh, so again, I wanna just reiterate as we close out Start time for students every day will be nine o'clock uh, for the month of September. Uh, teachers will be taking attendance uh, throughout the entire month, every day and period by period for uh, children in middle school and high school. Teachers will be recording lessons uh, and making them available every single day and, and they will be posted on the Google Classroom. So that way, uh, for instance, if your child's in K or first grade and they're unable to participate uh, when it's synchronous, uh, they will still have access to the content later on in the evening when you're able to assist them. Uh, masks will be provided to any child who needs it and they will be required uh, to wear them throughout the day. There will be opportunities for children to have mask breaks uh, should they want it. Uh, upon entering the school building every day, their temperature will be taken. And we're asking families if you could take their temperature at home. Your child has symptoms, please keep them at home. If your child uh, has a temperature above 100, please keep them at home. We are going to take everyone's temperature, every adult and every child upon entering the school building every single day. And in the event, your child has a fever, uh, temperature over 100, they will not be permitted to stay in the building. Uh, they will be taken to a separate room and you will be notified so that way they can be picked up. So obviously put yourself in their shoes. If they're showing symptoms, they have a fever, the last thing they wanna do is be isolated and waiting in a room for you to pick them up. That's really not fair to them. In the event your child develops symptoms and or a fever during the day, so say they didn't have a fever when you checked them, they didn't have a, a fever over 100 when we checked them when they first came in, however, they developed it later in the day, again, the same protocol will apply. Uh, they will be taken to a separate room and you will be notified so that way you can uh, pick up your child. 
I want to end by just saying thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your flexibility during this entire time. Uh, you know, you have also been phenomenal and extremely supportive. And I believe that's what separates the Newburgh community um, against everyone else. And although this is new, I'm asking you to, to embrace what's new and consider these challenges opportunities. And I know it's different and I know it's uncomfortable. And I also know that there are many hardships that you are currently facing. We recognize that and we completely understand it. And we are here with you and we will continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with you during this entire time. Please give us your input. Please give us your feedback. <clears throat> when things are going well, let us know. When there are things we can do better, let us know. We're in this together. And on that note, again, I just want to say thank you. And we'll be in touch soon. Have a great night and be safe. Be well, everyone.